20th century English mathematician and philosopher Alfred North Whitehead once stated that the entirety of the Western philosophical tradition, quote, consists of a series of footnotes to Plato. As far as ancient philosophers go, Plato is arguably the figure foremost in the public mind. Today, we'll take a look at what was and continues to be so significant in his work and why, as well as discuss the way the Western esoteric tradition has been shaped by his thought. I'm Ike Baker, and this is Arcanum. First, let's briefly define our terms, something we'll be doing quite often on this channel. The Western Esoteric Tradition. The Western Esoteric Tradition is a term that will be frequently used on this channel to describe a group of philosophies and practices which share mystical and transcendental motifs as well as specific ritual practices based upon certain foundational spiritual traditions. When we say spiritual, we mean that which specifically focuses upon and engages with planes and states of existence, which both include and transcend the merely physical. These include Hermeticism, Neoplatonism, Pythagoreanism, Astrology, Kabbalah, Alchemy, Freemasonry, Theosophy, and Rosicrucianism. The term Western Esoteric Tradition is used in contradistinction to the Eastern esoteric traditions, which include, for example, but are not limited to, esoteric Taoism and the sects of Indian and Tibetan monasticism and asceticism with leanings toward the cultivation of magical or supernatural powers, Siddhis in the Eastern Indian mystical vernacular. While the two are united in many ways and have influenced one another by way of a recurring cross-pollination, there are enough fundamental differences between the two to merit this distinction. Much more can and will be said on this, but for now, this brief explanation should suffice. Of course, the idea of magic does not originate in ancient Greece, but has a long tradition all over the world. And we can hardly discuss ancient Greece without mentioning two cultures which influenced and impacted it regarding philosophical and religious beliefs. These being, of course, the ancient Egyptians and the ancient peoples of modern-day Iran. This syncretism would eventually come to a culmination a few years after Plato, when Alexander the Great conquered Egypt and Persia, bringing Greek thought and culture to the broader Mediterranean and effectively creating what is commonly referred to as the Hellenistic world. The Hellenistic period is of absolutely central importance to the Western esoteric tradition, and I'll mention here that we will be covering a great deal of topics stemming from it in the future. Before we dive into our study of Plato, I want to make mention of one concept to be aware of, regardless of whether you agree or disagree. Based on several elements of Plato's dialogues, there is a current of thought which believes the core of his religious philosophy, or rather, Socrates' religious philosophy, to be something called ultimate monotheism. Ultimate monotheism is a term which describes the belief in several or many gods being projections or manifestations from a single creative deity or divine mind. More on this later. In our first episode, we briefly touched on some of the historical sources which are foundational to the Western esoteric tradition. Perhaps surprisingly to some, a recurring name is Plato. Who was Plato? Plato, or rather Platon, meaning broad or wide in Greek, was an Athenian philosopher who lived during the classical period of Greece. 
He was born sometime between 429 and 423 BCE and died sometime between 348 and 347 BCE. He was born Aristocles, but given the name Platon to describe his broad physique, which we can speculate was likely a product of his training as a wrestler in his youth. Other than being from a privileged and influential family, not much is known about Plato's early life. What the historical record does show is that his work was pioneering of written dialogue and dialectic forms of philosophy, and that it has been continuously passed on in its entirety for over 2,400 years. He founded the Platonic school of thought, as well as the Academy, or Academia, which was the seed for the Western university system. We also know that he was a wrestler and had some familiarity with philosophy as it was propounded in his day. It is impossible to speak of Plato, even topically, without also speaking of Socrates. This is not only because of how incredibly influential the latter was to the former, but also because Socrates left no writings of his own in his time. Being one of his students, Plato is one of three sources from which we read of Socrates, his life, and ideas. Owing to the style of Plato's literary output, being dialogues similar to plays, we are able to draw a much more compelling and vivid picture of Socrates the man than, say, a purely administrative document. In the works of Plato, we glean the character of Socrates, which to Socrates himself was arguably the most important aspect of an individual's life. Much of the philosophy of Socrates we learn through Plato's dialogues. This can make it difficult to discern just how much of what was written was Socrates and how much was Plato. Ultimately, in this case, the goose chase of historical veracity might perhaps be energy better used in the study, contemplation, and application of the contents of these dialogues. Next, we'll have a look at some of Plato's most central ideas and elaborate as to how these are pillars of the Western esoteric tradition. However, let me give one caveat at this point. There are definitely quite many other examples of Plato's thought and philosophy than the ones I give here. However, to do an in-depth examination of Platonic thought is beyond the scope of a single video. This video is merely meant to be an introduction, a starting point to Platonic metaphysics as related to the philosophy and practice of Western magic and occultism. We will absolutely be covering more of this in greater detail in future episodes, but the earnest student is sincerely encouraged to read and study the dialogues of Plato, and not merely rely on the interpretation of others for their understanding. We'll begin with the dialogue of Mino, a conversation between the titular character Mino and Socrates, in which the theme of virtue is explored. However, one of the most significant ideas in Platonic thought is arrived at as a consequence of this discourse, that is, the theory of forms, or Platonic idealism. This comes from the paradox which Socrates and Mino ultimately arrive at. Quote, A man cannot inquire either about that which he knows or about that which he does not know. For if he knows, he has no need to inquire. And if not, he cannot, for he does not know the very subject about which he is to inquire. End quote. The solution offered by Socrates is that there can be no such thing as learning as is normally understood, but rather a process of remembering that which we already know. This he calls anamnesis, a state of full knowledge of all things, which he claims is a product of the psyche or soul having come into contact with all ideas or forms prior to the incarnation in a physical body. The underlying concept being that as souls are immortal, they have limitless knowledge of all things through their prior existence in a world more real than the physical. Yet how could that world be more real than what we experience in the material realm? The philosophical concept of reality in this school of thought was rooted in the idea of changelessness. All things in the material world are subject to change, reflected by our concept of time. Yet in the realm from which psyche or soul transmigrates exist all forms in their most essential and changeless and therefore timeless reality. Let's use a simplified example of this idea. An apple which sits on the counter will eventually decay. An apple in the mind, as an idea called forth by an association with its name, will never decay. 
unless that apple is pictured as decaying or rotten. The mind itself distinguishes no difference between the reality of the external or internal form of an apple. The one more real is the ideal of an apple. The physical apple is merely its expression for a brief time in the realm of the material. All this is to imply that the idea is the reality. It is the blueprint from which physical things are created. Our souls, coming from and going back to this realm, which Socrates and Plato called Hyperuranos, or above the heavens, have had contact with all forms here. We see this idea elaborated in the work of Carl Jung, specifically in his idea of the archetypes of human experience. Integral to these ideas is the understanding that time as it is experienced rather than theoretically applied, such as in models of physics, does not exist per se. A human being's possession of sophisticated self-awareness, and memory in particular, allow us to recall events against which to measure change. For example, I was over there, I am now over here. It was daytime, but now it is night. As a unit of measurement, specifically of change, this is an anomaly, since we cannot move forward or backward in or with it. We can only ever exist in an ever-present now, and so where there is no change, no change at all, remembering that literally everything is change, movement, breath, even the flitting of our eyes from one object to another. Where there is no change, there is no time, and vice versa. In other words, eternity. The changeless, ideal forms which exist in potentia in this realm are what inspire the forms which enable physical experience in the material realm. This concept suggested itself to Plato as a solution to the philosophical problem of universals. That is the question of how one thing in general can be many things in particular. Now many people might be inclined to take this nuanced approach to consciousness as mere minutia. Yet, by bringing our awareness to it, we're not only asking questions that lead us to the core of our experience and the epistemology of reality, but also of awareness by contemplating the depth of a particular experienced phenomenon, we bring ourselves into communion with not only the object in question, but also with the subjective experience of a moment. The lived experience of awareness. This is not merely an intellectual exercise. It is an exploration of consciousness, which is, in my estimation, the defining essence of all magic. So let's clarify this problem of universals with an example. Take a tree, for instance. You might have even just pictured one in your mind's eye now, at the sound of the word. For some, it might have been an evergreen. For others, deciduous. For still others, it may have been an apple or cherry or maple tree. Perhaps one that we were well acquainted with as a child or have some special memory attached to. For others, it may have just been a vague and unidentified tree. For those of us that claim to have aphantasia, the inability to see pictures with the eye of the mind or image-making faculty of consciousness, we may be calling to mind some general concept or understanding of what a tree is. All trees are different and differ to varying degrees. No two are exactly the same, yet there is something that defines a tree. Let's call that a certain treeness. There's a scientific component to this definition, and this manifests itself in the experience of a tree, which is also a vital component in the defining of a tree. Perhaps it's a certain verticality of what we might call the trunk, or the triangular shape of its form created by its particular kind of foliage. Sundry other recognizable forms in themselves such as these all unite in the physical expression of a tree. Yet this idea of tree exists somewhere in which, being of sound mind, we all have common access to and understanding of on a mental level that transcends any one particular tree. How is this possible? 
What are the mechanisms behind this universality composed of particularities and divided amid particular instances of the universality of treeness? When we take time to actually think on these things, the question is staggering. It calls into question the nature of experience as a whole. Yet in the concept of the realm of forms or ideas, we do have a clue as to the nature of material manifestation. Patterns upon which nature constantly organizes itself. Patterns of higher existence, so to speak. Images and ideas, as if reflected, though imperfectly, down from the archetypal realm to the formative, where the information is translated and coded as if on a blueprint or the HTML of a web page, informing the processes of nature as to how to organize itself in order to bring forth the urge toward existence of some particular thing. Socrates goes on to comment in the dialogue, quote, Some things I have said, of which I am not altogether confident, but that we shall be better and braver and less helpless if we think that we ought to inquire than we should have been if we indulged in the idle fancy that there was no knowing and no use in seeking to know what we do not know. That is a theme upon which I am ready to fight in word and deed to the utmost of my power." End quote. However, the world of forms or ideas, idoi, as they are termed in the original Greek, is a theme frequently referenced throughout various dialogues of Plato. One such form is the idea of the good, or agatho. Plato likens the capital G good to the sun. He posits that the sun is responsible for the facility of sight, not merely the possession of physical organs of sight, the eyes. For without the sun's light, we still cannot see in darkness. This analogy is meant to convey something about the nature of the good, as the sun is the giver of light and sight to the terrestrial realm, so is the good that which not only facilitates the knowledge of a thing, but is the knowledge itself in the intelligible mental or ideal realm. Therefore, the good may be considered tantamount to the truth. We glimpse a potent analogy for the relationship of material existence and the good in the allegory of the cave, from what some consider Plato's piece de resistance, the Republic. Plato's allegory is meant to describe how our ordinary sense perceptions ultimately perceive only the forms of shadows of imperfect and unreal things. We remain imprisoned, as in the cave, for as long as we believe in the sole reality of the shadows we see on the wall. Yet, when one turns towards the light from without the cave, and observes the grossness and unreality of those things which generated the shadows that we had for a time considered our previous reality, one has now become initiated in the untruth of material things. As the initiate then further travels outside the cave, they are exposed to the often overwhelming light of the sun, the good. Several theories, including the abstract idea of the good and the world of forms, essentially transformed earlier Greek theologies of, say, Homer and Hesiod, which portrayed the gods and goddesses as anthropomorphic and possessing all too human traits, into an abstract spiritual metaphysics. The concept of transmigration from a world of ideas or forms to material existence is one that obviously implies a continuity of consciousness and a duality of worlds or types of existence. This is perhaps best elaborated in the dialogue Phaedo, the fourth and final dialogue of a series chronicling the last days of Socrates, before he was put to death by the Athenians for the charge of corrupting the youth. It details Socrates' conception of the immortality of the soul. Again, we see in this dialogue the concept of recollection as opposed to that of rote learning, posited as a kind of proof of the pre-existence of the soul. Here we find many compelling arguments, such as the theory of cycles or opposites. When we combine these two philosophical conceptions, that is, the recollection of knowledge not attained by sense perceptions, and the theory of opposites, we can be led to arrive at the idea that the soul 
being obviously alive, and as is said, uncompounded, is born to existence in the material, which is of a dual nature, being composed of the interaction of opposites. One thing in the material can only be known or measured by another. For instance, one stick is only short because another is longer. Here we must also distinguish that before the global dissemination of a priori reductionist materialism, the popular conception was that human beings were a composite. The physical organ of the brain was not believed to generate consciousness. Plato held that the psyche, or soul, itself was divided into three parts, each ascending in function and respective location in the human organism. This conscious component of humans was believed to inhabit the dense material body, not as somehow coming from or out of it. The psyche vivified or animated the material body, not vice versa. Today, the official academic party line is that consciousness is an emergent property, which is to say we know almost nothing conclusive about it, despite the widespread conception that it's somehow generated by the organ of the brain. So as the psyche was something decidedly alive, it could not be generated from something which decayed and died such as matter, except as when in a body. It therefore had to come from some previous existence. In material life, when that which was subject to death, the body, finally succumbed, then that which was not subject to death returned to its inherently unmingled state. It is from this death of the physical that the life of the psyche can later return to reanimate another material form, being born to the material out of the decaying physicality of matter. Another compelling argument is known as the affinity argument. It can be summed up as follows. There are two kinds of existences. A, the visible world that we perceive with our eyes, which is human, mortal, composite, unintelligible, and always changing. And B, the invisible world of forms that we can access solely with our minds, which is divine, deathless, intelligible, non-composite, and always the same. The soul is more like world B, whereas the body is more like world A. Therefore, supposing it has been freed of bodily influence through philosophical training, the soul is most likely to make its way to world B when the body dies. If, however, the soul is polluted by bodily influence, it likely will stay bound to world A upon its death. This again implies a theory of two worlds, one subject to birth, growth, decay, and death, the other a world beyond change and time, unchanging and deathless. Yet we are bound here for a time, and the transmigration of the psyche from one kind of life to another has consequences, as exemplified in the aforementioned summary of Socrates' exposition of the influence that the body has on the soul during and after each physical life. What is the best way to live then, according to the Platonic or Socratic dialogues? It is decidedly, at least by the middle period of Plato's writing, virtue. In Plato's conception, virtue is founded upon two vital concepts, eudaimonia and arete, which are well-being and excellence, respectively. In order for one to achieve well-being, they must engage in the pursuit of excellence, in Plato's opinion, a moral excellence. We find this exposition again in the Republic. Yet the pursuit of the virtuous, or arete, what we might call ethics, is dependent upon the knowledge of the good, this knowledge itself cultivates what Plato called phronesis, essentially wisdom, or knowing how to apply this knowledge in practical everyday life as situationally appropriate. To cut through the ambiguity in the gray areas of life and take the best course of action as to what was most capital G good. Action being the operative word. In other words, the ability to know the right thing to do. The attainment of phronesis, or practical wisdom, would eventually culminate in the pursuit of arete. Pursuit is the important word here, because as Plato's thought developed throughout his lifetime, he ultimately came to believe that arete, or perfect ethics, was not possible in the material realm to the extent in which it was in the beyond. The pursuit of arete was informed by the practical wisdom that was a product of the study of capital G good. It manifested in qualities such as temperance, justice, and courage, all sharing in some 
non-specific quality related to the expression of the, let's say, archetypal good. These qualities, as acted out repeatedly in response to circumstances and situations of life, are the manifestation of ethics and ultimately cultivate in eudaimonia, health or well-being. This was considered the fulfillment of the highest purpose of a human life. We see this echoed again in the Phaedo, where Socrates, upon unjustly being sentenced to death or exile, chooses death by ingesting poison. His constant consolation to both himself and his grieving students and friends who were with him on his deathbed was the ideal of the philosophic life, which is essentially preparing oneself for death, perhaps with dignity. Socrates truly never makes an apology to the citizens of Athens. He stands by his principles and his deeds because he believes them to be right. He believes this because he has not followed his own whims and caprice. He has abnegated his animal self and sought the higher existence of the mind in philosophy. The ultimate message being that even in death, virtue is a reward in itself and that the highest aim of a philosopher should be to free the psyche or soul from the desires and reckless wants of the physical body, thereby preparing the soul for its journey through the liminal space of the death of the body. It is in this manner that Socrates refers to the earthbound soul after death in the Phaedo. In freeing themselves from the animal nature, which continually tries to stunt and weaken the moral inclinations of the psyche, towards the good, a person may align themselves with the archetypal good and become like to it. Here we see an echo of the microcosm and macrocosm of Neoplatonic and Hermetic philosophy. In the postmodern age, we have witnessed the ascendancy of moral relativism. This is the belief that moral judgments are true or false only relative to some particular standpoint. For example, a person's culture of a particular time or place. However, the capital G good in Plato's conception transcends all such boundaries because it is archetypal. It is a philosophic idea pre-existing its physical expressions, like other ideas, according to Plato. We might even do well to reconceptualize this Socratic or universal type of morality as the study of cause and effect, and how that universal cycle of input and feedback manifests itself in human thought and behavior in the form of consequences. In this view, we perhaps glean what Plato truly meant by insisting that a virtuous life leads to happiness. Virtue is happiness. The paths are one and the same. As he essentially tells us through Socrates, virtue is its own reward. Therefore, we can safely conclude that acting in opposition to the virtuous, the good, can therefore only result as a species of punishment or unhappiness unto itself. Arriving at this juncture, we might stop to call to mind the hermetic axiom, as above, so below. As there is a psyche in each individual, which according to Plato is simple, uncompounded reasoning and continues on after death, then so must the greater cosmos be vivified Plato called this the psyche cosmo, the soul of the world. Later philosophers would propound this as the anima mundi. In Plato's dialogue Timaeus, we find Socrates describing the soul of the world. Thus then, in accordance with the likely account, we must declare that this cosmos has verily come into existence as a living creature, endowed with soul and reason. A living creature, one and visible, containing within itself all the living creatures which are by nature akin to itself. Plato's Timaeus describes this living cosmos as being built by the demiurge, constructed as to be self-identical and intelligible to reason, according to a rational pattern expressed in mathematical principles and Pythagorean ratios describing the structure of the cosmos and particularly the motions of the seven classical planets. This conception would highly influence the Hellenistic Judaism of the first few centuries CE. This was, again, a product of the conquests of Alexander the Great, a student himself of Aristotle, who was a student of Plato. It would also, by way of Hellenistic Judaism, influence the Gnostic schools of thought of early Christianity. The Greek word translated as rational is Logistikon. It can be translated a few ways, and given the context, 
Rational is a very good choice. However, I personally see something relating to the exactness and reliability of a physical law in this original term. We do in fact see that the universe is composed of laws which are certain and reliable, immutable even. The universe is orderly enough to continue and maintain its own existence, despite all of the apparent chaos within it. Yet it contains a portion of this kind of cosmic consciousness within its workings both large and small. We find this in the respective orbits of the planetary spheres, and in the attraction and repulsion of atomic particles. Everything in the physical world possesses a species of consciousness that allows for regularity. Again, we see clearly delineated the idea of the microcosm and macrocosm, which we first examined while reviewing theoretical models of how magic works in episode one. We find an apt analysis of the third part of the discourse of the Timaeus in the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy. This is an exhortation to properly exercise both the soul and the body to recover or maintain physical and psychic well-being. The well-being of the soul in particular is emphasized. It is through realigning the motions of our souls with those of the universe at large that we achieve our goal of living virtuously and happily. Let us now return to the Republic and once again examine what Plato suggests as the mundane application of these philosophic ideas. We find that Plato regards that the perfected society or state should be governed by a philosopher king. Essentially, a society's sovereign should be one who has learned to govern themselves. We see all the aforementioned doctrines and ideologies synthesized into a state through its officiating personage, a ruler. We come here to an understanding of what philosophy is, philosophia, lover of wisdom. Yet the wisdom espoused in the Platonic tradition is a wisdom counterintuitive to worldly knowledge. It flies in the face of all things common people consider practical and sensible. Why dare to question when there is the comfort of tacit conformity? Why abstain from temptation and material comforts? Why accept condemnation when you can recant and ask for forgiveness? Why choose death at the hands of a small yet influential group of malicious and vindictive captors when you can just move out of town? It is only one so disposed, subservient not to the lower nature, but to higher ideals, which do not partake of this world, but influence its imperfect reflections or expressions in the realm of the changing and inevitably decaying material. Only this kind of person can rise above the material inclinations which inevitably and perpetually plague, even almost 2,500 years ago, all of our societal institutions and systems. Is this possible? Or is this a naive and fruitless pursuit? Did Plato even think it truly possible? Quote, Until philosophers are kings, or the kings and princes of this world have the spirit and power of philosophy, cities will never have rest from their evils. No, nor the human race, as I believe. And then only will this our state have a possibility of life and behold the light of day. End quote. So, how does this all relate to magic and the Western esoteric tradition? Magic in the Western esoteric tradition did not start with figures like Crowley, Mathers, Gardner, or even Agrippa and Paracelsus. It was only passed on and oftentimes heavily altered through the filters of their respective experiences and personalities. Underlying magic is a philosophy, or more accurately, philosophies, encompassing metaphysics, ethics, theology, cosmology, and cosmogony. Many of these philosophies have existed for as far back as the historical record of relatively advanced civilization goes. It is upon these principles that magicians, both ancient and modern, work. Iamblichus, the Neoplatonist, used Platonic philosophy as his underlying basis for the work of theurgy, or literally, God working. Marsilio Ficino considered Plato to have expounded the Prisca Theologica, or ancient theology, in his dialogues and teachings. Great and influential personages such as Albertus Magnus and Pico della Mirandola sought and worked for years attempting to reconcile the philosophies of both Plato and Aristotle into a unified whole. Most of the principles put forth by Plato's metaphysical explorations of the nature of the soul and the universe have proven themselves to be workable theoretical models. 
yet for a magician and occultist. The underlying theories or framework of magic have been historically based on the work of Plato in some shape or form, whether that be from the dialogues themselves or from later commentators such as the Neoplatonists. These theories or models have proven valid, workable, and significant in the underlying or foundational level of magic and are of inestimable value and influence to the entire Western esoteric tradition. The idea of learning as remembering is of singular importance because it reveals a species of inner knowing, resembling intuition. In ancient times, many authorities believed divinatory revelation was given only by the gods. However, we can see a parallel or rationale in this idea of tapping into what some might call the Akashic Record or Collective Unconscious as a theoretical model for the basis of divination of all kinds. We see this also echoed in the Greek word for truth, alithia. It is a compound word whose roots are comprised of the Greek prefix a, meaning not, and lethe, meaning forgetfulness. So the word for truth, alithia, can be translated as not forgetting, in other words, remembering. The world of forms corresponds to the archetypal realm, or atzilut, as it is called in Kabbalistic traditions. It posits that we have access to these archetypal forms within our minds and can use these more perfected shapes as molds or scaffoldings in our own image-making work in order to create changes in reality that may more accurately reflect the spiritual truths of that realm. Continuity of consciousness not only begs that we must ultimately reconcile our actions in this life with the type of existence we find consequently available to ourselves in the next, it also reconfigures the juxtaposition of mind and body by retrospectively asking us to re-examine what we believe to be the source and function of consciousness. In doing so, we might just find that we have put something quite large into a very small box for a very long time. We see in Plato's ethics not merely some self-righteous or pious moralizing based on a particular creed or religion, but rather we find an exhortation to right living based on universal principles. And that this lifestyle, though it be counterintuitive to the physical animal aspects of ourselves, is the path to happiness and fulfillment of purpose. Because it exalts what we really are rather than merely what we seem to be for this very short transitory period. And that as the pattern of ourselves while here is reflective of the pattern of the whole, then in order to find well-being, we must align ourselves with these universal principles which manifest themselves in the microcosm of the human being as particular thoughts, but most especially as behaviors or actions. Morality in the Platonic sense is not necessarily right versus wrong but rather cause and effect. We find that the archetype of the philosopher king is in reality one who has used philosophy to govern themselves and has transcended, or in other vernacular, integrated the animal part of their nature. Theirs is the decision to make, beholden not to the prompting and urges of the material inclination, but subject only to the wisdom of the ideal, which is tantamount to the highest good. In this way, we wield the power of the universe while we hold a mortal form. In this way, and only in this way, do we command the elements both within and without us under the presidency of a consciousness aligned with the highest patterns of consciousness available to us. In this way do we square the circle, or spiritualize matter, uniting the super-celestial with the terrestrial, or heaven and earth. Exoteric analogies for the esoteric concepts of the greater and lesser, the macrocosm and microcosm, the above and the below. In Plato, we find a veritable spiritual science. Yet, before Plato came someone who was arguably the most significant influence not only on Platonic thought, but also on philosophy in general. The legendary personage who allegedly coined the term philosophy, Pythagoras, in my own studies, I have found Platonism to be a continuation of Pythagoreanism, in the same way that the Neoplatonists took for granted that they were working within a Platonic paradigm and never dared to call themselves Neoplatonists at all. We will cover more on Pythagoras and Pythagorean philosophy in future episodes. 
What are some of your favorite platonic dialogues related to magic? Which would you have included? Are you a platonic idealist or an Aristotelian nominalist? Leave your thoughts in the comments section below. If you've enjoyed this video, like and subscribe to my channel, and remember to turn on all notifications. Please consider contributing to the Arcanum Patreon for exclusive bonus videos, interviews, and tutorials, and to help me continue to produce more free content like this. Join me again in the next video, where we'll be diving deeper into the historical, theoretical, and practical sides of this and many other related topics. Thanks for watching. In Luke's.